So in terms of the, the appropriation, we were focused on not taking the medicines out of the Amazon and putting them all over the world, but actually bringing people to the Amazon, creating local economy, creating sustainable cultivation around the plants. Fast forward 20 years, now the children are interested in again. Now there's intergenerational teaching taking place. Many, many people, now hundreds, thousands of practitioners have actually been able to get their kids into college and get their kids into other kinds of secondary education. I know that there is misappropriation taking place. That's when people don't go through the training and they're leaving out the knowledge itself and they become a glorified bartender basically serving psychedelics. Hamilton Souther, welcome to the Holistic Abu Duane podcast. You're, you're a pretty unusual guest for me to have here. Uh, because you're working within the plant medicine world and the, the mushroom world, because I always have to tell people mushrooms are not plants, so we have to distinguish. But the, the psychedelic space, the, 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 the transformation, the integration of these experiences, I think is super relevant to what we go through as, as parents, as you know, the birthing women that I serve, all of the midwives who are out there doing this hard work. So um, we're going to be getting deep into that. Um, so welcome. Thank you for giving me some of your time today. Oh, thank you so much for having me here, Nathan. It's a real pleasure. And I've you know, heard a lot about your podcast and just really excited to be here. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got a bunch of mutual friends. I know Kyle Kingsbury is a dear friend of mine. Um, if you guys haven't checked out Kyle's show, it's the Kyle Kingsbury podcast. I think you've been a guest how many times on his show? I actually haven't been on his show yet. You haven't? Uh, no, we've just been in person. I've been on Aubrey's show a bunch of times. Oh, but, okay. Uh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So no, Kyle and I just met in person for the first time this last month. And just hit it off. It was an awesome meeting. Oh, and, I didn't uh, know that. Incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gosh. No, we just sat for the first time together, and uh, it was just truly amazing. So I look forward to uh, potentially being on his podcast. I'm going to talk with him this weekend, and I'll give him a little maybe... nudge. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That'd be nice. <laughs> amazing. I'm going to be seeing him next week. We're recording this right now, the third or fourth of November, and um, 2022, and. Um, I bet you're going to be on the show, on his show, before this episode even airs. So we'll, <laughs> we're just going to connect all the dots here. Um, Hamilton, uh, I don't want you to have to repeat yourself because you've been on a lot of podcasts. You, you've, you've immersed yourself in the work of sitting with people through the ceremony. We'll just use the word plant medicines for, mm -hmm. for years now. Tell everybody a little bit about your background. Like what, ec what expertise or wisdom are you bringing into this conversation? Uh, sure. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, I got introduced to plant medicines of various forms, and I ultimately ended up in a traditional uh, plant medicine experience in the Amazon. And um, I literally crossed over the boundary from being a participant to uh, being trained in a traditional apprenticeship with traditional elders. And um, since 2002, I started Blue Morpho, which was really the first plant medicine center for Amazonian plant medicines, psychoactive and non-psychoactive. A lot of people just focus on the psychoactive side, right. but we were actually focused on the, the pharmacopoeia that represented the Amazon and the ancestral knowledge of hundreds of medicinal plants. And so uh, we were the first center to open up that kind of medicine, uh, you know, as a form of herbal medicine and energy medicine to people from all over the world. And then um, I was influential in starting the neo-shamanic revolution that's become the psychedelic renaissance and have been really a proponent for the safe and professional use of these kinds of plant medicines because they are so potent. They're very strong and they're legitimate medicines in their own right. Yeah. I've been a proponent of that for the last 20 years, trying to guide people, especially when they're not finding the solutions in Western medicine that they're looking for, that this maybe is an avenue that could provide those solutions. There is so much we could talk about right there, uh, especially because as I'm sure you've learned, I am not so much an advocate for using Western medicine for everything under the sun. I think it has its purposes. If I had my leg chopped off with a saw, you know, a, a, I don't know, a, a chainsaw or something, I'd I'd go to the emergency room, but there's quite a bit that the Western medical model doesn't seem to be able to, 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 you know, the needs that haven't been met by the Western medical system, which is why I'm, I'm guessing so many people are now dabbling in the psychedelic world because it's providing such a, an opportunity to, to open, to open up and to heal from traumas, et cetera. Before we go down that path, um, I do want to ask you real quickly, we're both white men. Is there any sort of cultural appropriation of these med these medicines, these ceremonies? Have you seen that, and how do you uh, how do you <laughs> navigate that? Because I'm sure that's that's been a part of your story. What's up, everybody? It's Nathan, the host of your favorite podcast, the only OBGYN podcast that matters, the Holistic OBGYN podcast. So here's three things that you can do right now. Number one, if you like these episodes, if you like the show, share it with people you love. They're probably going to like it too. The second is to support our sponsors. I've aligned myself with brands that make the best, 
highest quality products out there, all pertaining to fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, parenting, you name it, support them, let them know that you're paying attention. And then third is that I want you to take a moment and click like. Let the Googleverse and the interwebs know that you're listening, that you're paying attention to the Holistic OBGYN podcast. Believe it or not, this really, really, really matters. So it's so important that I'm just going to take a brief pause right now. I'm going to let you go and click that like button. So just don't mind me. I'm just going to, going to wait. All right. You've done it. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think I've said enough. Let's get back to my conversation. Sure. Um, you know, when I went down to the Amazon, I think what's important to understand is that the practices and the traditional indigenous use of them was dying. And I don't think people talk about that. They were no longer interesting to the locals. They had very little purpose for them. There was an encroachment of Western medicine already into their societies. They had been shown the efficacy of certain kinds of uh, big pharma-based medicines. The children didn't want to go through the equivalent of training, which, it, you know, apprenticeship is like training in Western medicine. You, It's somewhere between an eight to 15 year process to ultimately graduate and be considered a viable practitioner of these kinds of medicines. You're not just a psychedelic sitter. You actually learn hundreds of medicines and how to be able to diagnose and treat an uh, unbelievable number of illnesses that are important wow. to the tribal people. And so there just wasn't as much interest in that. There was already the Western, um, you know, coin-based economy. So, you know, getting paid money for your day's labor, et cetera, was already there. And so when I came in, uh, I came in really as an anthropologist and I was interested in participating in the experiences and not really appropriating the medicines. But if we discovered real medicines that could provide real benefit, opening that up to really rekindle interest in it. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. So we made our first scientific discoveries really in linguistics, not in the medicines themselves. The locals that I was engaged with and the indigenous people I was in living with did not have a word for trauma, depression, anxiety, or PTSD in their language. And when I realized that, and that that was a, like a true anthropological discovery in, in linguistics, that uh, there had to be a reason because the life can be very difficult there. And that should create trauma and depression and anxiety oh, yeah. and different kinds of problems. And so what I realized was that there was an immediate plant medicine intervention on the backside of severe illness or severe trauma. And uh, that's what got me really interested in the plant medicine space and uh, looking at that. So in terms of the, the appropriation, I think it's really more emerging and a sharing of ideals and needs. And we were focused on not taking the medicines out of the Amazon and putting them all over the world, but actually bringing people to the Amazon, creating local economy, creating um, sustainable cultivation around the plants and the use of them, really educating people on the value of the plants and functioning as a bridge for the locals to be able to share this ancestral knowledge that was more than 5,000 years old. Now with the rest of the globalizing world at that time, um, we didn't see it in any way as an exploitative thing. We saw it as a helping supportive thing to their economies and supporting each other in really the perpetuation of the use of those medicines. Wow. To close on that, 20 years later, so fast forward 20 years, now the children are interested in again. Now there's intergenerational teaching taking place. So grandkids are learning from grandparents. They're passing the knowledge on. It has been completely reinvigorated. There is a purpose to their own societies associated with it. And there's a means in the quote unquote Peruvian or Ecuadorian or Colombian economies to actually subsist and survive and even now thrive that wasn't there before. And it didn't wow. make any sense to me that these people were now living with Western money, yet they were so poor that mm. they were being exploited in every way. Many, many people, now hundreds, thousands of practitioners have actually been able to get their kids into college and get their kids into other kinds of secondary education beyond that, that never would have been a possibility before. So I really do think that we've supported it. I know that there is misappropriation taking place. For me, that's when people don't go through the training. They don't go through the eight years, nine years, 10 years of training necessary to be a sacred carrier and, and administer of these medicines. And they're leaving out uh, what was most important about the practices, which was the knowledge itself. And they become a glorified bartender, basically serving psychedelics. That to me is the misappropriation of the, you know, the medicines. And they've kind of separated the education model out of it. I think we have to get back into the education model, get back to those communities and let these medicines thrive on a global level. <laughs> Man, I, <laughs> I couldn't have said any of that better myself. And 
I've got a couple things, you know, I want to steer this down the, the path of how are these medicines being used for treatment of specific conditions or diseases, as we say. Yeah. But I also want to bring up, you know, the famous quote from Krishnamurti, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So when we consider the role of these medicines uh, through many indigenous peoples across the world, but, you know, of course, in the, the Americas, these, from tobacco to ayahuasca to peyote to um, to, to to pachuma or, or, or wachuma, there there are so many medicines available, and I'm not I'm only talking about the psychotropic, as you mentioned. Um, right. There are so many medicines that have provided a link for people to their environment. They've harmonized with their environment. This was actually a part of who they were. And now because there isn't an economic incentive, or at least there wasn't until you started doing this in a lot of people, um, th these traditions and really their connection to Mother Earth, you know, call it what you will, Gaia, it has started to dissolve. And that actually is a problem. So I don't think this is like a white man's burden. We need to save it. And I don't, certainly don't think that's what you're saying. But I do think that there's a distinction between what you are doing. And and by the way, I was just in a traditional Lakota sweat lodge on a sacred hunt with Monsal Denton. And the guy who led that, he said he had to he had to practice an, an apprentice for 10 plus years before he was allowed to pour. And that's right. an important, like, that is an important path to walk before you can really embody what a Lakota sweat lodge requires as a guide. And I think that what you're, what you're describing here is, Hey guys, this is not like you take a weekend retreat and then you start sitting and offering combo. Like there is a, an initiation to this practice itself. And even I, you know, I, when I provide medicines of various types, I won't be explicit because I'm a doctor. I have to, you know, be very, very clear of my intentions and the boundaries and what my expectations are and, and, and the expectations that I, that I hope that my clients will gain because there's still so much to be known. The, the humility, I think, is critical here. And I'm so glad that you bring that into, into your practice. Yeah. I mean, you know, I got to the Amazon in 2002 when people didn't even know the term ayahuasca. And mm. at best, it was being offered as an add-on to a kind of a jungle trekking tourism thing. Mm. So a, a local would come with his bottle of ayahuasca and he would share it with some tourists and they would have a ceremony and they would have an experience, and many people had had profound experiences, and many people didn't. And uh, I went deep into the forest. I was looking for something more meaningful than that. And I ended up in a very remote part of the forest in my first ayahuasca ceremony and being told in the visions that I would actually train there. The person I ended up training with happened to live 300 yards, 400 yards downriver, uh, who was an 85-year-old elder who had been practicing for over 50 years. And what I was uh, first sort of introduced to was this understanding that people come to these healers with legitimate illnesses, and they're looking for intervention, treatment, and resolution. And most of those are not psychological or psychosomatic illnesses, but really physical illnesses. Mm -hmm. And they know the forest through the visionary realms, so through these ayahuasca ceremonies, learning the forest and its absolute energy and absolute totality that the plants represent, they've learned to, to use a number of different plants in the hundreds to treat all of these different kinds of illnesses. And I was really interested. I wanted to learn. And they finally accepted me after a, a year and three quarters of, of living there, just, just living there, just learning how to subsist, learning how to live off the land. And I had participated until the point that they accepted me in about 30 ceremonies. And they had been great in many different ways. They had allowed me to be a participant. But the night they actually accepted me was this an incredible encounter. I was given a cup of ayahuasca. I was taken into vision. And the vision was all black. It wasn't all colorful and everything people talk about. It was literally black. It felt like the life was being compressed out of me. At the time that I blacked out in this kind of tremendous agony, I don't know how long I was out. When I came to... I was actually in the visionary space with the elder and his number one um, student at the time, who was also an elder in his you know, right. And they were with me. They, we had merged into this uh, common visionary field. And through that field, they started to train and teach me. And that was something that I had never even heard of before. And so that really started the education process. And then we would be in ceremonies, literally anywhere from 15 to 20 ceremonies a month for the next four years. And it was in that, in that time, 
a direct teaching about their medicinal practices, about their energy practices, about their knowledge and about their use of the plants, their relationship with Gaia, Mother Earth, their relationship with the total life force that they called the Tukwatana of the forest itself. And it was literally almost just like when I went through the university, a step-by-step series of apprenticeship and training to the point that they said, okay, you now can practice on your own. And that's the only time then you're actually even allowed to touch the bottle of ayahuasca. Wow. So, yeah, you're not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed to touch it for the for years. This is a sacrament. This is Correct. not to be disrespected. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No one touches their ayahuasca. That's that would be like walking into someone's pharmacy and just grabbing pills. Like you yeah. don't do that. And it would sure. be considered even beyond that. It wouldn't even just be a theft. It would be a transgression of something truly sacred to them. Mm. And so I was I was I was, you know, indoctrinated into that, brought into that and then trained and uh, that's, you know, created the foundation of our work and then also our messaging. And I just think that that's very different to what we've seen in the Western psychedelic culture around this, where you hear of people that are participating in ceremonies and becoming carriers of these medicines in a very short period of time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you made a perfect, I think, uh, example, uh, the allegory of the the training of a doctor in Western medicine. That's what I was born of. It's been 14 years and I still mm-hmm. bring humility and like, I just don't know. And, uh, but even after all of that, it's the practice of medicine. You never have all the answers. So bringing that humility to, Hey, yes, it was a 10 year path or 14 year path for me before I can even call myself and feel comfortable saying I'm here to do this, provide this service. I think that's lacking in our world. You know, I think we all want to like go and get that weekend workshop under our belts and then we can start offering transformative medicine, not realizing that, Hey, yes, most of the time it goes well birth, for example, but you also need to be willing to accept that sometimes things aren't going to go well. Has your experience provided you the insights and perhaps the clarity as to what to do, how to help guide them back on path, etc.? So as a, a person who offers medicines, you mentioned ayahuasca, so we'll just, we'll just use ayahuasca as an example, sure. but maybe we can also talk about some of the non-psychotropic medications. In sure. sitting with ayahuasca, what is the role of, your, of a guide? And uh, yeah, how, how do you describe that to people? What is your, what is your job there? It's actually really sophisticated. Um, first of all, you're you're the person who collects the plants and then creates the the teas or the brews that people are ingesting. And so first you have to know how to do that in a safe way. And um, your next role is to dose and to know the amount that someone's supposed to need. And it's different for every single person. Mm. And so just learning how to dose takes years because it's not a dose for everybody. It's not done by body weight. You literally have to be able to look at the person and know. (laughs) And if you don't know, then you're not supposed to be the one dosing. It's that simple. Um, Then you're you're the sacred uh, container that gets created in the ceremonies themselves. It's sort of like the energetic version of an operating room or or the the place of healing that people are going to come to. That needs to be safe energetically from, you know, all different kinds of energies that are there because you open up into a very sensitive state. I, the way I try to describe it is, um, you know, science has said that to be in this state of consciousness we're in now, we filter out trillions of stimuli a second so that we can sort of fix the image of what's going on in this great field of waves and energy that's all around us. When you go into these visionary ceremonies, you actually want to turn on your awareness of all of those trillions of stimuli. And so you become very, very sensitive to energy, to the field that's there and the energies that are within it. So mm. um, you're you're there holding that container together and making sure that it's safe for everybody. So much in terms of the people that are there and also any kind of outside energy that could be also part of that. Um, and then the you have sort of the onset and you're you, it's really important that you guide the onset of the the plants they're very powerful chemically they're also very powerful energetically but chemically you're you're creating this drastic and dramatic change in a very short period of time and so you're there to be able to help guide that and you do it through sound and rhythms mm-hmm. so you guide through sound and rhythms really through the inducing of a trance state to make it easier for somebody to go through that onset period. Uh, Once you go through the onset period, then you're actually very hands-on. We use different techniques to be able to guide the totality of the experience. Most of them are through sound and some are through uh, pure intention themselves. Uh, 
the pure intention part is harder to relate to if you haven't had the experiences because you're like, well, where's the interaction? Mm. But, you know, you have you learn to project your energy through that space. And I think the best way to describe it is that after a, a session or after a ceremony, the next day, people will say, oh, you got up from your chair and you were you were standing over me and we never left our chair. And then the other person said, no, you came over to me. And the other person says, no, no, you came over to me. It was at, it was during these chants or during these ecros that you actually did that. So those are skills that you learn wow. how to be able to project yourself through the body and to be able to intervene into someone's visionary experience. And when you're doing that, you're actually uh, invoking and channeling different kinds of healing-based energies into the person. So when someone has a certain kind of illness, you can actually see it manifest in the body in um in the visionary field, you can see it uh, coursing through the body and the body regenerating it and recreating it. <laughs> As a practitioner, it's your job to actually disrupt that, like a pattern disrupt, and really recode that in the body itself. You see it change and you see it transform energetically. You see it get released out of the body. Um, when things get released, it's very important as well that you know how to guide and direct those energies away from others. Because you'll hear stories of things coming out of one person going into another. That's not responsible practice. That's mm. someone who doesn't know what they're doing. So those energies leave. And um, and then ultimately, you guide and direct what we call medicine energies or healing energies into the body. And they take the place of the illness. So it's sort of a removal of the illness and a replacing of these other kinds of energies that now literally create health over time in the person. Or they create healing over time in the person. And um, all of those are your roles simultaneously throughout the the session or the ceremony. Yeah, man, I'm so glad I, that we've met. I've I've got like a million questions. In fact, I want your phone number after this because I've got <laughs> other questions for you. And I think that you're gonna, I think I'm gonna join you down in uh, down in South America at some point. Um, Hamilton, I think one thing that our society is desperately craving is, is twofold. I think one is authenticity. The other is, I think we're craving, we're lamenting the lack of, of rites of passage. And I think that mm. birth is an important rite of passage. I think there's a transformation of spirit that happens in birth and in death. And we've over-medicalized, over-pathologized these experiences. So what happens, or the way that I frame it, and maybe you can help me condition this language a little bit, is that anything that's a, an, an immense stress on the body requires integration of that stress. Otherwise, it gets locked up as trauma. Hmm. And I think a vast majority of what people are experiencing and perhaps this, this sense of grief, something there about even their, their typical birth, they had a baby, they're healthy, but something doesn't feel right. There was this lack of ceremony around this incredible transformation of spirit for the baby, for the mom, for her partner, for the whole unit as a whole. Can you talk a little bit about the integration of these experiences, any, any sacred, you know, transformative experience, which I would certainly say an experience with ayahuasca, um, any of these other medi you know, medicines that we've been talking about, but also birth and perhaps even at the end of life at death, we intervene, we create more stress on it than needs to happen. And then of course, the biggest issue is we haven't, we don't have a, a way of ritualizing these things anymore. There's no ceremony or integration. Can you speak a little bit about the role of integration after any transformative experience? Yeah, I mean, I think first the the issue is, like you said, it's a lack of ceremony or a lack of ritual. And I just think of that as a lack of celebration. It's not not celebration in the sense of like a party, but celebration in the sense of this massive change is about to happen. Mm -hmm. And it is such a positive change. We want to prepare for it. We want to be fully conscious as we go through it. If that's the birthing process and then also the healing process after it. And you think about the physical transformation that the mom goes through, which is, you know, incredible from conception through the pregnancy and then yeah. the birth itself and yeah. then the healing that has to take place just physically associated with that. And so there's this, an idea of wanting to be fully uh, engrossed and fully part of that experience, fully conscious of it and celebrating it every single uh, step of the way. And then after it is this idea, like you mentioned, integration. And integration for me is the idea that I'm going to continue to draw from this experience, learn from this experience and, um, and let it form a new reality for me. Yeah. Little by little, by little by little, people think like integration is a weekend and done. And I'm saying, no, I'm still integrating my first ceremony 22 years ago. 
I want to draw from these experiences everything I possibly can, they trigger not just a change in my life, but they trigger a new direction that my life has taken. And uh, becoming a parent is a new direction. It's a change of archetype. You can't say you were mother or father before you have a child. I've talked to many, many parents and they said that, um, you know, it's like a change in their operating system. That yeah. is a shift in consciousness. Something real has taken place. And so I, I don't think we're giving enough uh, importance to mapping that change within ourselves, getting into it, really embracing it, learning from it, extracting maximum value from it, fully embodying it, and doing that with our partners and our closest loved ones so that we all go through it together. Like I haven't mm. heard of anybody talking about the the whole family supporting the sacred masculine or the whole family supporting the sacred feminine right. coming right. together and mm. and really really supporting the growth of that. And I think of it like the growth of of nature, like the bee pollinates the flower and then the little apple or pear starts to grow. That grows and grows and grows and grows into this great fruit. That's the harvest. Yeah. That's what we need to be doing together. And yeah. that to me is integration. So when we have these big events that some people are describing as traumatic, but they don't have to be, that's a key element. These that's things right. do not have to be traumatic. We're treating them in a way that makes it traumatic. But yeah. I think of it as like the snow globe, like our consciousness is, it, it takes on a, a fixation in reality, it becomes normalized, we get used to it. And this big experience happens. And it's like shaking up the snow globe. Yeah. yeah. Well, we want to guide that process of letting that snow globe come down into a new reality. And when it does, in it, you're now father or mother in it, you now have a new sacred role, which is the, the bringer of life and the now the guide for this life. That's a sacred role in its own right. Then we have the you know, the family and community around us that in the tribal society celebrates this graduation that you've gone through. And this, it's such a, an important role that you've now uh, taken on. And so I think if we add those ideas into our life, integration is actually really easy. And it's something that we can uh, share and sort of harvest from, you know, all the time. What you're saying, it is going to be, uh, it's going to be reciprocated and people hear that in people hearing this because you're speaking the language of how our communities I think could operate around birth. Mm. And like you said, this experience of birth doesn't have to be traumatic. That ayahuasca ceremony doesn't have to be traumatic. But if Correct. it's lacking this this integration part afterwards, what I always tell people is if you take a bunch of mushrooms, you're going to have a heck of a trip. But the trip is actually the easy part. It's the integration mm. afterwards that makes or break what this For means sure. to you and how you show up in the world. And I think the same goes whether you're on medicine or not. Going through birth as a as a new father, etc. This is an area where our community, being so siloed off, we don't have any respect for what this is. This is not a medical procedure. This is this is a shaking of the snow globe, and how yeah. we allow that snow to restitute itself is going to be reflective reflected in how you show up as a parent. So I appreciate you sharing that. I'm wondering, do you have any direct experiences with uh, women or their partners who have been pregnant? They've gone into ceremony and they've come out with some integration afterwards that was really um, insightful to you. And if not, I, I have a brief story I can share, but I'm curious what your experience has been. Yeah. You know, one of the beautiful things about Blue Morpho and creating community around these medicines was that we got to meet people and go on their journey with them. And we actually had a number of couples that formed through our retreats themselves, but we also had a number of people coming down that had fertility issues. They were looking at how to be able to get past that, how to be able to get pregnant. And so we got to go on that journey with them. We wow. helped them through ceremony, actually change their physiology so that they could become pregnant. They immediately, uh, within literally 30 days to 60 days post retreat, got pregnant. Then we walked with them through the entire process of, of being pregnant, going through the birth. and then. Also, the ceremonial experience beyond that of how to now integrate into, uh, you know, the new role that, that they were having. Wow. And yeah. we presented it as that idea of celebration the whole time. Um, and, you know, that was part of the, the ways that I learned about this idea of the sacred transformation and role, which is actually really hard for us to go through. Mm. And how we could do that together. One of the ways that we actually prepared people for this was uh, we would take them into ceremony and in this altered state of consciousness, we would actually go back in time to their own embryonic state. So we would go for to the formation of their zygote. We would actually take them pre-zygote. Oh so we would bring them together in consciousness as sperm and egg. 
And we would take them through the, the, the sexual expression of that of their parents into the zygote itself so that they're fully conscious now of becoming zygote. And then walking through the cellular division until they're all heart. And the little embryo is, is so much heart, it doesn't even have a brain or a mind yet. Wow. And what it is to be that heart and the connection with source and divine energy in that heart state and what it is to ultimately, you know, grow limb and become that of mind and brain and then walk them all the way through their own birth so that they could experientially know what their own child was going to go through. And that then they could welcome their child saying, you know, I've gone through this experience. I know what you're going to go through. I'm now conscious of it. I wasn't conscious of it the first time around. Now I'm conscious of it. I'm going to be the sacred guide for you through this experience. I'm going to guide your consciousness through it. And we're going to welcome you into this world to be an active part of our new family. And it was, you know, it's it's miraculous. It's There's no words. There really aren't. Uh, although you do lend quite a bit of language to something that I, I see as increasingly uh, <laughs> ineffable. Um, in, in many regards, when women tell their birth stories, there is an ineffability to it. You know, it was ecstatic. Mm. It was painful. It was traumatic. I mean, there's all these adjectives, but to really understand from a, from a man's standpoint, what it means to give birth is really hard. However, I mean, it's impossible. There's no, there are, is no way for me to know. So I will offer that up to everybody who's skeptical of, of me speaking the way I do about childbirth and whatnot. However, I will say, from my own experience and through many men I've met along the way, they have gone through a rebirthing experience. The pain, the ecstasy, the, the messiness, they've gone through that entire experience in ceremony, which tells us that there's far more to this than just what meets the eye in the physical, the, the measurable as we like to, to approach it from the lens of Western medicine. Um, that is really fascinating, Hamilton. I, you know, fertility is is of course right now on the decline. It has been for several decades, um, from both the male and the female, stand, you know, side of things. And yeah. and um, when I start working with clients, you know, the physical is the easy part for me. We can do the labs and the imaging, and maybe you need surgery to get, remove this big thing off your ovary, or we need to remove a septum inside the uterus, or or whatever polyps, you name it. There's all these things that the Western medicine system again does well. But what we end up turning to is, oh, everything seems to be working well. You're still not getting pregnant. Let's jack you up full of synthetic hormones and let's force your body to get pregnant versus an alternative, which is my approach and which clearly if, if we were working together, which I'd love to, is uh, let's invite the spirit of this baby in. And part of that is we need to wrestle with the undigested morsels of your own birth, perhaps even your mother's birth. We need to consider this as not a linear thing. But all of that collective trauma and wisdom, intertwining those and calling in the spirit of this baby, making sure that you are firmly on the ground, but your antenna is connected up here and realizing that you're more than just a meat suit walking around waiting to get pregnant. Like that's, that doesn't always meet all of the needs. So on the mental, emotional, spiritual level, that's where some of these medicines, getting the ego, getting the eye out of the way, and perhaps working on your connection to something greater than yourself, that might be the invitation. That might be why you know, your, your uh, medicines, these ceremonies actually help to call in the spirit of the baby. Have you, uh, as, the, as the, I don't even say guide, because you're not really guiding, right? You're more facilitating and holding space. Mm -hmm. Have yeah, you had any... Okay, great. So that's the language. Have you had any direct experience with um, the spirits of babies? Like, have you have you encountered that in your work? Oh, for sure. Seems like a dumb this, question. I realize because well, I knew your not. answer, it's, but it's not a dumb. People question. need to hear this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's not a dumb question. What people don't understand is that um, you know the Western way of learning about consciousness is so isolated. Yeah, and so then we're then we live in this like isolated, individualized bubble. Yeah. And then we're using archetype and, and category as a way to try to understand similarities between us instead of these universal similarities that mm. we all experience that just fundamentally part of nature. And yeah. so when you go through these kinds of ceremonies, the, the that we're talking day, about, I think in the archetypal world, the Imago day is really, I, I think, uh, lends itself to this, but go on. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, first, I mean, in, in my work, what I do with people on uh, literally every retreat is I simply say, look, everyone before us is our ancestry. It's not just where the branch we were on the family tree. It's, it's everybody that was before us. So we need to go through, you know, what, 
like this unbroken chain of experience of birth to death to birth to death, generation to generation to generation that unfolded to get to us. And I yeah. think of it and present it as a miracle. This yeah. is a miracle. And I have a, you know, some, some sort of proofs for that. Like no two bodies are the same. They're, they're, no two men are the same. The body is unique to you. The matter that makes up your body is ever changing, yet only ever the matter that's connected to you at that given period of time. Um, you know, the breath is never repeated. We have we take this breath and then it's the next breath. You never can go back and repeat that breath again, et cetera. And so I see this tremendous miracle. We all share heartbeat. We all share thought, but not the same thoughts. We all mm. share circulation, but not the same experiences. We all have blood, but it's everyone's different blood. Like there are these miracles that make up life itself. And part of that miracle is how life just fundamentally works. Yeah. And the conception to the embryonic experience and the embryonic experience to the creation of a new being, that new being now having a body. And I, I personally think that the meat suit concept is aired. It's, it's diminishing the miraculous value and complexity that you represent. We are, yeah. I call it technology. Yeah. I call it, you know, material technology. We are this material technology. It's not just health. It's how our technology is working and how we can foster through our choices and decisions, a greater functioning of that technology. And then how that is the home of our consciousness while we're alive as a human. And I think that that's just fundamentally miraculous. So by taking us through these experiences, seeing the children that are, that are coming into the world in vision, you can see them. You can see literally in vision, all the babies that are embryonic right now in the world. You can see all the humans right now in the world. We can tap in to what earth is actually creating through us and the, the next evolution and the next generations. And I think that that's unbelievably important because we have a responsibility as humanity to provide a better world for the unborn children that are coming into this world. Yeah, And those are yeah. our choices and decisions. And if we collectively take on that responsibility together and say, you know, the next generation is going to get a better world. They're going to inherit a better world than the one we got. We're going to start to move humanity in a direction of uh, real advancement and growth and development. And that's going to affect our medicine. It's going to affect our practices. It'll affect our culture. It'll affect our soul, who we are as spirit in this incredible, miraculous and mysterious existence. And it's, it's not too big if we all do it collectively, individually in little bits. Right. All I have to do is is take the, the time and effort and energy to be better to every child that I meet. It's so easy to be nice to a child. Yeah. All I have to do is be nice to that baby and I did it. It's yeah. that simple. All I have to yeah. do is share love with that child. Today I got to see my nephews and one of them is two years old. And all I did was shine love on him. And mm. that was doing it. It's so easy. Yeah. And then we can collectively guide. The, 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 you know, the children, and we can turn this, like I said, into celebration instead of trauma, and we can turn it into uh, an evolution, a growth for us, instead of something that we're reacting to. Amazing. Hamilton, I have to say, I haven't been this jazzed halfway through an, an interview in a long time, because you're, you're touching on all of these intangible things that are very real to people like me and you and a lot of our, our circles who've sort of seen behind the veil, once you see the man behind the curtain, you really can't unsee it. It's hard to put language to this, but I think you actually do quite a, a good job and, and it clearly reflects your wisdom and your experience in sitting with these things. Um, I want to I wanna now venture into the space where whereby in the United States, we've been at war, really across the world, we've been at war with nature. I mean, this is since biblical times, we had this shift whereby human beings thought that they were they were separate from nature and that nature, and I'm using nature loosely, but the trees, the flowers, the bees, the, the, the lawns, sure. everything is really for uh, here for our consumption. In the Potawatomi language, this is something I learned from uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, the Potawatomi language identifies the tree as the beingness of a tree. In other words, it's a subject looking at another subject, another being, as opposed to an object and an object can be objectified and utilized for my benefit. But what I learned from midwives who have worked in birth down in South America, specifically in the, in the Amazon River Basin, they learned that ayahuasca was not a means of, of breaking free. Ayahuasca was actually a part of connecting to the environment, as I mentioned before. And so they would be taking ayahuasca before, during, and after pregnancy. And even the baby was getting dips, finger dips put into their mouth 
because it was going to keep them connected deeply to the Amazon. And in fact, and I'm sure that you can talk to this, but when you're selecting plants, what I've heard, I've never actually gone this far with ayahuasca, but it's not so much a matter of, of, of what is the botanical classification. It's more that the plants is, is what taught them what the use was for. It wasn't that they went into some lab and started experimenting. So by not be connecting their babies in the uterus and, and after and immediately afterwards with the Amazon, they're actually disconnecting them from a great source of wisdom. So they, of course, and I'm using they because I don't even re remember specifically the tribe that this midwife works with, but they saw the jungle as not just helpful, but it was actually a part of them. And without the Amazon river basin in their immediate surroundings, they would perish. There was no way around it, which is obviously in contrast with what I described uh, in our war against nature, whether it's viruses, you know, antimicrobials used to treat everything under the sun, this anti-anti-anti thing where we silo ourselves off, stay out of nature because there's dangerous things out there. The, the you know, Shipibo and other peoples in South America they embrace it because without it, they could not be who they are. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to just open that up and see where you want to go with it because I'm sure you have a lot to say. <laughs> That's vast, and I appreciate that. That's a beautiful setting of the table. Just a softball question here for you, just Hamilton. Tossed. i got to throw a softie to you Thank once in a you. while. Thank <laughs> you. Um, yeah, I think it's important on the Western side of it to understand what is a matrix of ideology and an understanding that that's in our mind and our mind is of nature and that it's a fallacy in its totality to think that you can be separate from it. Um, you can build walls, but the walls that you build are made out of nature. The nature is cellular molecular matter that is self-organizing. It's part of the earth itself. You can build as many cities as you want. You can build as many walls. You can put up as many fences and you can't stop what I call ever churn, which is the ever churning, ever moving, ever changing, ever, ever evolving uh, nature of matter itself. Earth is not a static ball. It's not just a sandstorm. It's not just this isolated event from another. The molecular expression, the cellular expression of Earth is ever evolving, ever moving, ever churning. We recycle our cells every seven years in their totality. We recycle cells every day. We, every breath is a recycling of this energy. The matter that's in the bag right now of, of that you're bringing into you, that is becoming you. That's being utilized. It's not just a, a thing that can be isolated from you. Yeah. An aspect of that is now part of you. Yeah, That is known in the Amazon. And when I got into training, the... So, so first, that's a fallacy to think that we can somehow separate ourselves from nature. That's taking place in our minds. It's delusional. It's a delusional mythology that became popular 2,000 yeah, years ago, 3,000 years yeah. ago, 4,000 years ago. It has not served us well. It has served us really well in terms of the creation of certain technologies, the creation of certain kinds of medicine. We never would have created those things if we had just had we are nature and we are one with nature attitude and understanding. But we as a collective will transcend that understanding in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And our own nature will become very important to us again. Now, if we go to the Amazon, they never lost that. They literally never lost it. It It is when you live in the Amazon, you realize that the Amazon jungle that you see is born out of the Amazon jungle that's decomposing. So the cycle of life is in front of your eyes all the time. And you are part of that cycle of life and you you understand it. It's it's natural to be in sync with it when you're there. And so in my early 20s, when I moved in, of course, as a, as a science mind thinker, I got in there, I'm sitting with these elders and I'm saying to them, how, how did people learn about these plants? There's no laboratories. There's no, there's no tests. Like the way we study to create something, um, they knew, and I asked them how, and they said, oh, a long time ago in history, which means 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, um, hmm. there was a common language. Plants, animals, and humans spoke a common language. And through that common language, the plants and the animals taught us all the knowledge that we have. Hmm. So now that can be a story, that could be a mythology, or it could just be fact. Yeah. But if I look at it from the, the notion of story or mythology, it means that I have, a, as a being, I have an ability 
to directly tap into nature and have nature directly teach me. Yeah. So I start to test that theory. Is this true? I'm an outsider in their culture. They're just handing over a cup of ayahuasca and basically saying, survive. So I'm turning <laughs> to that nature and I'm saying to the nature, nature, take care of me. Right? And the nature says back to me, of course we will. You are a steward of this nature. You love us. It says most of the humans mm. come here and they're just trapped in their minds and they don't realize we're watching them. Yeah. We're watching them walk through the forest talking to themselves and they don't even see us that we're here watching them back. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do after an ayahuasca ceremony was to get naked and go dive in the river. The river, I would still be in vision. The river was filled with giant anacondas, piranhas, yeah, I was going to say, you're going to get eaten, dude. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Naked. You want to test, test nature? Naked. And I would literally envision, project to the animals that they were there to protect me. I was not their food. I said, please don't harm me. They said, you're not food. Yeah. You're not food. And I would see them in under them. And the water's dark. It's it's inky black at night. And I would see them in this this color coming off of them, this field of energy that they represented. Not one ever harmed me in 20 years. I was never wow. once harmed by the forest in 20 years. The forest said, we will protect you. We will keep you safe because you love us. You don't take wow. more from us than you need. And so there was that interaction and that communication. They call it the Tukwatana and Yucatana. It means the total force of that nature. And they believe it is conscious. Wow. It's not, it's an inert thing that you can just touch and take from. It is consciousness and you are of that consciousness and you share it and they believe it. And in ayahuasca visions, they experience it. Yeah. And it's through that experience that the plants come and teach you the medicine. So it's not, here's a whiteboard and here's what the plants do. Mm. It's the the facilitator or the, the knowledgeable one, the medicine man, takes you into vision and says, apprentice, this is the lapuna tree. Lapuna tree, this is the apprentice. Lapuna tree, teach the apprentice. Lapuna medicine. <sighs> then they take you into ayahuasca and they say, apprentice, this is the ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, you've been here for hundreds of thousands of years. You're millions of years old consciousness. This is this young human that's only been here for a short period of time. Be a steward for them, teach them, guide them, and they make that connection. Yeah. And then you, as the apprentice going through that experience, now have to cultivate that relationship. So you cultivate the relationship to the plants. You beg them and ask them to teach you. They start to come into your visions. Pretty soon, you know their chance. Pretty soon you can, in your visions, you see these tapestries of sacred geometry. It's this multidimensional field of the most intricate geometry and patterns you can imagine. Yeah. And, and you start to realize the Lopuna field is different to that of the White Arcospe, is different to that of the Ayahuasca, is different to that of San Pedro, it's different to that of Psilocybin. You call on the, these individual plants and all the patterns and colors, context, texture change representing this new plant. Through that interaction, you learn when you use one plant versus another, what is the appropriate plant to be able to use for different kinds of illnesses and treatments, how you, you use them in a visionary state in the psychedelic ceremonies, also how you use them outside of the visionary state in poultices and tinctures and teas. So how you actually administer these plants outside of it, you learn and vision how you actually collect the plants. What's the safe way to be able to take their barks? What part of the plant has the appropriate chemicals in it that are the appropriate medicines for the person? Does it come from the roots? Does it come from the barks? Does it come from the leaves? Does it come from the branches? Does it come from the flowers? Wow. Which part of the plant you take? The, the teachers do not tell you that verbally. They show you in vision. And that's how you actually learn. When I got shown that and that connection with nature, that idea that we could not be separate, that nature was not a dangerous, scary thing, my whole life force turned on. I was 23 years old. It was like I had been given back to what earth really was and how earth became self-organizing life. And my soul turned on, my spirit turned on, my, in my intelligence turned on, and my thirst for these experiences became unquenchable. Wow. Like I just wanted to do this over and over and over again because I had a Western analytical mind and it was now being fed with this experiential learning and it made so much sense. 
And it made sense that I would be of nature, that we would be of nature, and that through that connection to nature, we would be able to find something deeper than just our ego and deeper than just ourselves, which seemed like such a desert for me at that period of time. And it was like the entire earth of nature was there to be loving, uh, caretaking. It wasn't scary. It wasn't dangerous. It was the exact opposite. It was loving. It was nourishing. It was Mm. giving. And it was a sacred relationship. And we were loved. We were coveted by nature. We were treated like the mythological stories from religion of being so important that I didn't experience that in elementary school and high school. I didn't experience that from my peers. I didn't experience that from the Western culture I was in. I was treated like an object. And all of a sudden I was treated like a sacred being in and amongst all of these sacred beings and that it was actually appropriate to be able to harvest and use of those sacred beings, but in balance with them. Mm. And, and in, in a loving, giving relationship with them and medicine became alive. It became Mm. alive. It was the exact opposite of inert. It was alive and Mm. it was, it had, it had conscious context to it. And it was one of the greatest gifts I ever experienced. And so I can corroborate those understandings and I can understand why the tribal people make sure that they foster that connection with the forest, with their children, because that's how they pass on the knowledge from one generation to the next. (laughs) That's our show, everybody. Thank you, Hamilton. Uh, You just dispelled virtually every myth we have in our Western culture in one diatribe. Thank you. (laughs) You're very special, (laughs) my friend. Um, You know, I'm studying anthroposophic medicine, which, of course, came out of Rudolf Steiner's body of work. Mm -hmm. And Rudolf Steiner's, I think, completely misunderstood because of our objectification of of our patients in medicine. And, you know, out of Steiner's work came Waldorf education and biodynamic farming and anthroposophic medicine with the help of Ida Wegman, a German physician at the time. But Steiner actually borrowed quite a bit from um, Goethe. Oops, sorry, dog just hit the camera. <laughs> Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who's actually described as a poet from the 18th and 19th centuries, early early 19th century. And so way about 100 years before Steiner's time, um, but Goethe is described as a poet, yet if you actually r- look into what his body of work was, he was he was a Renaissance man. He was into music composition. He was like Hildeg- Hildegard von Bingen, kind of like the same kind of cloth. He also did quite a bit of investigation on plants. And in Steiner's work, in my studies now, I'm going for my third board certification in anthroposophic medicine for what it's worth – it's very confronting because of the vast majority of time, we're spending as much time with plants as we are with human. And the reason that that's relevant, I think, is because in what I've developed is an understanding that as I'm growing plants in my garage and in my garden, and I'm trying to figure out how these plants, like what do they need? What, what do they need from me? How can I best steward them? I'm learning that what we've been asking all along is what can this plant do for me as opposed to what can this plant teach me? And that sounds like, you know, you know, uh, lip service, but there's actually something very important to that, especially if you're going to be, um, if you want to have this transformative experience that this plant is not, is this plant is here for you. It wants you to engage with it. And I think we could probably say that just about, just about any plant. You don't need to have a, tw- you know, 12 hour purge necessarily to experience, although we will talk about that next. I I think that what we've lacked, what we're lacking is instead of allowing the garden to grow and asking, wow, what is this garden trying to teach me? We say, I want my garden to grow like this. And again, we objectify the, the plant world. So there is quite a bit, I think, of exploration that us Westerners could probably learn from this. And I think fortunately for you, 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 you had this awakening, so to speak, in your early 20s. So how old are you now, Hamilton? Uh, 44. 44. So- 20 years, 21 years later, you're, you now have a, a more, a, a probably a deeper understanding of our connection to nature and the cosmos than most people have developed throughout their entire year, you know, entire lifetime. So um, for those who are interested in, 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 in exploring this and maybe trying to understand this consciousness and connecting with it, because I know exactly what you're talking about with the sacred geometry. When I use psilocybin, for example, you know, people say, have you seen the grid? And when you're on one of these medicines, uh, especially if you're in really, really deep, there are these patterns that form, but they're not random. They're not like hallucinatory patterns. You're actually Mm -hmm. starting to be able to connect with Mother Earth herself. 
And it's actually very heartwarming. It can be scary if you, if you don't go in with the right set and setting. And I think it's because people don't, you know, this is not a drug you go and take at a rave and then you do some Coke or whatever else. This is a sacrament. And if you're able to sit with it and go in with the right intentions, these things start to unveil. I mean, they, they uncover themselves. And once you see it, you get it. it it's a feeling. It's, a, it's something you carry into your everyday life. It can make you a better person. It can also make you a worse person if you haven't sure. integrated it appropriately. Um, so I just wanted to share that. I, I also wanted to ask, you know, a lot of people are scared about doing these experiences because of how hard it is. And of course, you know, it, there's really no way around the, the difficulties of childbirth any more than there is the difficulties of maybe um, connecting with some of these medicines in the way that you offer them. But the purge comes up quite a bit where people will say, I just can't get over the idea that I'm going to be purging I don't think people maybe fully appreciate what this purging experience is for some. Can you elaborate on that a little bit for people that have been maybe hesitant or apprehensive? Yeah. Um, the, in the simple aspect of it, uh, there is onset purge and then there's cleansing purge. And there are different ways to work with a little bit more sensibility and uh, a little bit more precision to limit the onset purge. Right. The, typically what happens is that you're you're ingesting chemicals that as they go into the body, they create a shift in consciousness and shift in energy that's so dramatic so fast that you just get overwhelmed. Yeah. And when you do, naturally, as part of that getting overwhelmed, you kind of lose your bearings, you lose your equilibrium, you can be filled with doubt and fear that you're creating. Or so it's really important to understand that it's just you're having such a, a new experience so quickly that you start to create some doubts and fears and mm. you can get some nausea and then you purge and then it just comes out. Um, we actually work in a way to try to minimize that. So, you know, on a, in a week long retreat with us, we might do four sessions. And in those sessions, the first one is an introduction, which is literally truly an introduction of the plants into your body and going to what you were saying about a relationship. That's what we're cultivating and yeah. creating. It's yeah. not a, I ingest this, I want an experience. It's a hello <laughs> and please come into the body super gently. Take and I'm me to dinner first, Hamilton, you yeah, know, that type exactly. of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to give 24 hours to this process <laughs> of introducing these plants into the body so that this relationship can start to form. And wow. some people get it and some people don't, but everyone gets it by the end of the week, right? Because mm. they realize what we have done in terms of creating that, that introduction and that meeting. Then you start to get into the experience. Now, if you're there for healing, and I think that this is really important, there's that I've given, I've been given so much plants that I'm saturated. And so my body's actually expelling it because I can't have any more. Right. So I've reached a saturation point and then the body naturally purges. You, you can't overdose on these plants alone. So if you ever hear about that, something, someone has added admixtures to the plants and um, they've somehow adulterated the plant medicine and they've created a poison. So please understand that that's the differentiation. If yeah. you have pure psilocybin or you have pure ayahuasca or you have pure San Pedro, you actually cannot physically overdose on it. Mm. So you don't have to have a fear of that, but you can get to the point that your body is so saturated that you can't absorb any more and you will throw it up. It will come out of you. You may defecate wow. or have diarrhea and your body will just expel that chemical and you will not have any more of it. And that will be the amount that you have at that time. Wow. So we, we work with people in a more sophisticated way. The, the traditional, you know, tribal way is here's the saturation dose, have the saturation dose, anything you don't need will just come out. And then they, they assure that way that you've gotten a hundred percent absorption, right? We're a little bit more um, precise and we try to give you really the amount. So you don't need to, to throw up you know, mm. in essence, too much medicine. And that comes from right? experience. Again, we haven't Correct. done a clinical trial to say that based on your height and weight and all this other stuff. No. Yeah. 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 It's conversation and it's knowing the person. And, you know, I may work with four or five different brews so that I can know that some are stronger and some are lighter and, and, uh, some are mm. thicker and, you know, based on your metabolism, some people metabolize very slowly. Some people metabolize very quickly. We ask these questions. So it's, it's like a little bit of a hybrid from the traditional practices and indigenous practices to a little bit more of, um, you know, question and answer and getting a feel for you as a unique yeah. individual. Now, yeah. then there's the purge where you literally have something physical in your body, like a toxin or residue from 
from drugs that are not good yeah. for you anymore. Yeah. Like you are an addict and you don't want to be an addict anymore. And you want to get the residue that's in your hair follicles. You want that out of the body. You want the, the fat cells that have stored these chemicals in your body. You want it out. Well, that's another kind of purge. And people will attest that they feel like the plant medicine goes through their body. They feel like they get scanned on a cell by cell basis, which is a wild experience to have to be conscious of that. Um, and then they feel a drawing of these chemicals bonded to the plant medicine and back into the stomach and then a natural release of it. And that kind of purge is part of the practice of medicine. It's part of healing. And it's <laughs> what you do after having any kind of traumatic experience. So in the Amazon, if you get, you know, if, if you're part of these traditional societies, not everybody, like the cities don't, people in the cities have kind of forgotten their way. But if you're part of these traditional societies and you have a, a surgery, like a gallbladder removal or, you know, something where you get put under general anesthesia, after that, like two, three, four weeks later, when you're you now good to go, you'll go into an ayahuasca ceremony to actually purge the body of any of the remaining toxins of any of the other medications that you were given. They want wow. you to get fully to the other side of that. You're not going to yeah. carry the, that residue in you forever. And people will say that they have actually experienced the drawing of these toxins, these heavy metals, these things that are causing illness in their body, literally into their stomach and into their bowels. And then they just come out. Wow. So what I actually do through the That's practice amazing. is I guide somebody really into the most open, into the most centered into the most grounded state of consciousness possible going through this process so that all we're doing is releasing toxins and releasing things that need to come out of the body and then it's it's not a foreign concept it's not like oh oh why would i throw up it's just give me the bucket Ugh. and it comes out immediately yeah. and then someone yeah. feels great afterwards and so i think we can dispel some of the the sort of rumors and and you know, kind of weirdness we get around this idea of like, of, of understanding, wow, this is actually a traditional healing mechanism. This is a way to get something physical out of the body. And I tell people this all the time. If you don't have something physical, there's no need to purge physically. Yeah. You'll release sweat. You'll release energy sweating. You'll release energy breathing. You'll get hot or cold. You know, we'll have blankets there for you if you need them, et cetera. But that, those shifts that you go through is purging. It's just not that acute physical vomit or diarrhea that people tell a big story about. But yeah. for me, yeah. that purge needs to be purposeful. Otherwise, I don't see a reason for it, right? There's no reason to go into extreme nausea. On the contrary, we want to transcend that. There's no reason to cause physical discomfort. We want to transcend that. So, you know, as a recap, we take you in, we introduce the plants over the first couple of days. We build the relationship with them that we were talking about where it's a give and take with nature itself. There's a petition to the plants for healing and transformation or the ascension and awakening of consciousness and learning. Um, then there is the removal of anything that's necessary to remove. And if you don't have it, you don't need it. And then there really is the transcendent states of consciousness after the purging, where all of that knowledge is transferred to you, the learning takes place, and uh, really an astounding experience of, of opening and awakening is possible. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to need to have, you know, it's the one medicine I actually haven't had is ayahuasca, interestingly. And um, so I, I speak like I kind of know, but it's just because I, everybody around me has, and I hadn't felt called to do it until very recently. And I, I actually think that's an important part of the process is, you know, you don't cancel a business, a business trip and make your way for a quick stopover to do some ayahuasca. I mean, maybe some people do. That's not the way that I approach these, these types of experiences. Um, the other thing I'll add is that going into any um, altered state of consciousness, it doesn't even need to be you know facilitated through plant medicines, but the uh, the the role of of intention setting going in, mm. that's a part of the set and setting. That's the mindset part. Um, although I'm not so sure we should really call it mindset because it's actually not my mind that's necessarily creating the intention alone. It's actually more of of uh, it's it's a little bit more ethereal than that. When I, I recently had an experience while on the sacred hunt that I mentioned before, where we took some medicine and my intention going in for whatever reason was, I, you know, what is the, what is the purpose of the heart? And mm. it, it came in the form of a question, but that doesn't, doesn't need to, but for whatever reason for me, that's what came up. And in the ceremony, what came to me were not 
uh, you know, this model of the heart. And it was like, well, actually it's done like this. It wasn't like that. It was three words came out I, that I, 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 I sort of gathered in the experience and came out with were presence, reverence, and patience, hmm. which even when the way that we describe it in the Western model, really the way you show up in the world, your heart, when you open your heart, it allows you to have reverence, patience, and, and uh, presence in the world. So I, I give that as a little example of what I mean by intention setting. Can you describe, uh, you know, just to conclude our conversation, describe what does the role of intention setting um, coming into ceremony with you? What, what role does that play? Yeah, intention is one of the most important parts. And so I'm actually really glad that you bring it up. Um, this is how the sacred relationship gets created. And intention is not just your reasons for being there. So mm -hmm. most people start with their reasons for being there and they can make a list of it. And then I even tell them, listen, your intention really does come from your heart. And we think of the heart as your, your connection to infinite unconditional love and the part of you in terms of your consciousness that is already connected to everything. It's the mind that is figuring things out. The heart already knows. It's this place yeah. of deep yeah, knowing. Of course. And so we say inside your heart that your intentions are already there. And so I tell people like, you can put words to it and you can become more sophisticated in how you express the nature of those words, which is kind of a brain training and a mind training process. But you want to give your heart to that plant medicine experience. You're giving your heart to yourself. Mm. You're opening that infinite unconditional love for your own well-being. And you're giving that love to yourself uh, from the very beginning of, of the process. Your intentions are in there and they represent a depth of knowledge that is is so core to your being we could think of it as like soul it's like mm. why your soul is alive mm -hmm. it's, it's connected directly to your purpose it's connected to your existence itself it knows more about you than we know intellectually in terms of like our our psychology about ourselves yeah it's where our true motivations are and it's what's really driving us to that ceremony or to that plant medicine experience and it's it's the part of us that is always on our side so whereas the mind sometimes has gotten to this place where we self-sabotage or we're, you know, not in a, a place where we're really aligned with ourselves, the heart is always there for our best interest. And it's centered in that understanding. It's communicating through the cells all the time, this energy that is about your health and well-being. And the mind may tell us something different. And so heart is where that intention is. We go in, I guide people to just let the, the plant medicine experience go right through the heart. The heart is also our safe place in that experience. So yeah. if the mind starts to have difficulty, we just go into the heart. Um, and then we really learn that the heart isn't just a pump pumping blood. That's a very mechanical way of understanding it, but it is actually core to our consciousness and something to be discovered and something to be uh, ultimately investigated and learned from. It's why there's that innate bond with ch child. It's why there's the ability to you know love something truly forever. It's why we have such a strong bond with um, with life itself. Why we're connected to that life force energy that flows through us. Our intentions are in there, and we give ourselves to the experience through it. Yeah, yeah. You know the the term the solar plexus um, comes to mind. You know it sits right right adjacent to the heart, and uh, it's where that gut feeling comes from. You know, it's not you're not going to intellectualize your way through life or birth or death. There's there's some deep knowing there, and I think that these medicines help us get back in touch with that, which is why I think actually that that reason alone is why I think that these these experiences are so transformative. It's a remembering that you're okay. You are mm. just fine. You've you've over intellectualized your life up until this point and maybe you'll continue, but for that brief moment, you get to see through the clouds so to speak and you have this deep remembering that like I am okay. Mm. You know, it's not just a little thing you get at Marshalls where it's like I'm enough, I'm enough. You actually feel it. It's it's, sure. it's it's not a matter of convincing anybody. You now feel it and you know it and you walk away in many ways a different person. So, um, Hamilton, I, I appreciate you so much for sharing and, and being so open. I will be joining you down there at some point. When the invitation comes, I will be there with you. Um, uh, for those who out there who are interested in this, they want to find you, uh, tell them everything they need to know, and we'll send a lot of people your way. Oh, fantastic. So uh, you can find us at bluemorphotours.com. That's our main website. And you can find out all about our work with sacred plants there. So bluemorphotours.com. And you can find us on social media, on Facebook and Instagram at Hamilton Souther Official and on YouTube at Blue Morpho. Beautiful. 
Hamilton, thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing in the world. Thank you for coming in with such humil- humility and uh, sort of like through the eyes of a child is what I say. You know, everything, there's there's so much here to be unpacked. And um, I think we kind of just barely skimmed the surface, but I really appreciate your time and um, we'll be in touch. Oh, Nathan, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. And uh, it's just a real honor. So thank you guys so much.